Meet my personal rig. Now, what I mean by that is I probably spend the most time on this machine, and many of you were asking what the specs were of my personal rig, so I've got it right here in front of you, and I'm gonna talk briefly about the specs, uh, and then I also want to get straight to the delitting uh, because I'm a little frustrated with the temperatures right now, and I'm a little too stubborn to switch out the cooler. So this isn't like a super beefy cooler, it's very modest. Um, this is the Cryorig H7 Quad Lumi. So it, it steps up the TDP just a little bit uh, over the regular H7, uh, but with the overclock that I have running on it, temperatures are getting pretty spicy, especially when I'm rendering. Uh, so we're gonna try delitting, see if we can lower those temps and maybe even crank out a few extra 100 megahertz or so uh, across all six cores. If you're still looking for an all-around excellent headset, the Sennheiser PC37X has you covered. Excellent microphone, incredible sound as always from Sennheiser products, and a price that won't break the bank. Check the link in the video description for more details. So this system supports an Intel Core i7-8700K, and it's running at 5 GHz right now. Like I said, pretty toasty, especially on this like roughly 150 watt TDP cooler from Cryorig, but I like the way it looks a lot. Uh, and I'm an aesthetic person, I want something to look as good as it performs, so I'm trying to find a healthy middle ground, and that's why d is going to come in handy today. The choice between an i7 and an R7 CPU is a tough one. I game mostly on this system, and that's where the i7 has a slight edge, so that's why I've stuck with this one in my personal rig, although I do most of my video editing and rendering on the R7 2700X custom loop build, it's back behind me, um, and that's what I'll edit this video on, just for example. Uh, the GTX 1070 Ti EVGA, this is a beefy 3 uh, slot card here, is a super quiet card, I recommend it. The 1070 Ti is a very healthy middle ground between mid to heavy 1440p gaming and even some light 4k gaming if you really want to get into that. Um, I game at 1440p 165 hertz. This card is perfect for that. Even a 1070 would be fine for it. Uh, you could probably squeak down to a 1060 if you want to drop some in-game settings, but I can pretty much max anything out in 1440p with this card. Uh, and the, the extra power draw, right, with the two 8-pin VGA supplemental power connections uh, gives me a healthy overclock as well. I am running, I believe it's just 16 gigs of 3000 megahertz Corsair Dom Platts. I like the way they look. The silver complements the motherboard nicely. This is the Maximus 10 uh, ROG board from ASUS, Z370 of course. I have a 1000 watt Be Quiet power supply in here. It's semi-modular, but we have custom sleeve cables from Tony. His channel is linked down below. It's Virility PC Customs. I love the stuff that he does in his channel. I also love the cables that he sends us. These look super sexy and I've used them for like 10 builds now because I love purple. I love the ambience, the, the overall aesthetic of this build. I do have a couple more Be Quiet Silent Wings 3 fans up front. It's super quiet, a relatively cheap exhaust fan, but I just turned this all the way down uh, DC mode in the BIOS. And that's basically it. Storage, I have a 500 gig M.2 drive uh, behind the graphics card, and then I have a two terabyte hard disk drive uh, in the front here. The case, of course, is a Fractal Design Meshify C. I have the non-tinted tempered glass version. That's what I recommend. I don't think that tempered glass that's tinted would look good with a build like this because it would pretty much hide uh, the cables and other things that I want to show off. And that is about it. So now we're going to get to the delitting process. I'm going to show you step by step how I did it. This is the first time I've ever used liquid metal uh, to you know, reattach the IHS to the die, and then I use liquid metal again to attach the cooler to the IHS. So a double layer of liquid metal and a double layered sandwich of sorts. It's gonna be interesting. I wanna see what the temps are. Hopefully it's worth it. Hopefully I don't have a failed D-lid. Let's cross our fingers and let's go through the steps. All right, so to start things off, we do need that baseline. I have the H7 Quad Lumi Cryorig Cooler cooling the 8700K. Our, our V core is 1.35. I could probably tweak that just a bit more, but I'm not worried about doing too many things in the BIOS right now, just because it doesn't matter as long as we keep the same uh, settings before and after the D-Lid. So 1.35 volts and five gigahertz, and here are the results. This is what we have up front. I'm gonna run IDA64 and get another set of thermals just so we can compare two different benchmarks, uh, and then we'll throw some games at it and show again and before and afters there. Uh, so the important thing to note, we had about 2% of thermal throttling here on the Cinebench run, and now we're gonna run the IDA64 stress test for about 10 minutes or so and see our maximum thermal throttling percentage. Also keep in mind T-junction for Coffee Lake is approximately 100 degrees Celsius, meaning that anything at or just below 100 degrees Celsius will result in severe thermal throttling. Again, only 2% here isn't too significant, uh, but we didn't have you know a straight up 
peg of 100 degrees during our stress test. It was just under that. So the CPU predicted that the cores would reach that temperature, and that's why they thermal throttled before and kind of to spare itself, which is a smart technique. I mean, obviously, you don't want the CPU running that hot all the time. So that's why thermal throttling takes place. T junction is again that threshold, and we're going to see how quickly we hit it and how long we can maintain at or just below T junction with the CPU thermal throttling for about 10 minutes. And okay, I'm not going to let it go for 10 minutes. Turns out just one minute will do it. We're thermal throttling upwards of 25%, and our cores are staying pegged at or just below 100 degrees Celsius. I don't really feel comfortable. You see 99 degrees on that one core there. I don't feel comfortable keeping the CPU at this at these temperatures for very long. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop it. And uh, that was more or less to preview that it's relatively stable. Um, and we're again going to take this result here. I guess we'll just do a one minute comparison between the two. It's not a, a it's not a very accurate comparison because the time span is so short. Uh, but this is the I mean this is the dire situation we're in, right? We're running at five gigahertz, 1.35 volts on Coffee Lake. Uh, so let's go ahead and delid, and then uh, I'll tally up some numbers, and we'll compare them to some graphs and see just what the deltas actually were. So the delid kit we're going to use today comes straight from Der Bauer in Germany. We used his i9 delid kit in this video right here, and I was very impressed with how easy it was to use. I delided a $2,000 processor. That's how much I trusted his products. So I fully endorse Der Bauer delid kits. If you guys want to delid anything, I recommend going straight through him. Uh, these tools are very well made, very efficient, very easy to use, basically stress-free. I think the cat is destroying stuff in the background. So like I said, the dealer process with this kit is very simple. You have two primary components here. This is the base plate, whatever you want to call it. I just call it the base plate. It's got Der Bauer's logo on it. It's got a white arrow right here, and this denotes the orientation of the CPU. So line this white arrow up like you would uh, in the socket of a motherboard. That is the correct orientation the CPU should be sitting when you delit it. Take this tool right here. It's just a small bracket that slides into the base plate, and you're going to wedge it fully against the IHS of the CPU, and then take this screw, thread it through the base plate until it becomes very difficult to turn anymore. Basically, you're pulling this bracket into the IHS, that's how you're gonna delid the CPU. It's not gonna take much force with the Coffee Lake SKUs. It took a lot more force with the i9. That's why that delid tool was much beefier. Uh, but this one here, maybe one or two turns past when you can't turn it anymore with your fingers, using this tool uh, will remove the IHS. You'll see it kind of slide forward uh, and that will indicate that it has become detached from the substrate below it. Uh, basically it's glued right to the chip and when you dislodge that glue, the IHS will kind of slide around. You can kind of pry it up any way you want. Just be careful because you don't want to damage the die underneath. Now this is where opinions begin to shine because there isn't one set way to do this next part. When you have the IHS removed, I recommend scrubbing all of the glue residue off of the chip at first. Uh, and then you can decide from there whether you want to remove it also from the IHS and then re-glue the IHS after you have added the liquid metal or you could keep the glue residue on the IHS and uh, just decide to let the IHS rest over the chip, which is what I did. So I actually didn't use any glue uh, to attach the IHS back to the substrate. It just kind of sits there. As long as you turn your case down, you just let the IHS rest there. When you install it into the socket, you don't have to uh, really worry about the glue because the mechanism itself includes a lot of tension, right? So the IHS isn't gonna move around once you secure the socket lever. And that's exactly what I did. You can see I had no problems with it. Uh, and that's almost recommended because you could apply too much glue, if you don't know what you're doing, uh, between the IHS and the substrate, and that would result in a too big of a gap between the die and the IHS, meaning that you're gonna have improper contact, heat won't transfer efficiently, and your D-lid will fail. I've also heard of people using double-sided tape to temporarily hold the IHS in place, Kind of getting ahead of ourselves though because we haven't actually applied the liquid metal yet. Now speaking of that, I went with Thermal Grizzly's Conduct a Knot stuff and this is pretty mainstream for liquid metal D-lids. I recommend them. Essentially you want to wipe everything down with these alcohol pads, then make sure everything is dry, and then add just a tiny pin prick of liquid metal to the die. You can use the included cotton swabs to spread it all out. It can be a little stubborn. The surface tension on this stuff is very weird. It doesn't behave like water. It's actually like super sticky in a way, even though it's not like glue, it's very runny, so be careful, uh, and you don't want this stuff to run over the edge of your CPU, because remember, it is conductive, 
this is conduct a knot after all. It took a while, but I spread it out as evenly as I could. Even when it seems like there's not enough on there, trust me, there is. You're also gonna wanna apply some to the IHS side of the CPU as well. Um, try to keep it as consistent as possible. The IHS really only makes contact with the die over the die surface area. So if you are spreading it over extra parts of the IHS, you're really doing yourself no good because those parts of the chip don't really produce any viable heat. You can see mine's not perfect, but as long as you're covering all the die area, you should be fine. But remember, the closer you get to perfection, the more efficient the IHS of the CPU will be. This isn't like direct die uh, mounting, right? That's even more efficient because we're removing a thermal barrier, uh, but it's pretty darn close. And direct die mounting is just a pain, especially with these kinds of sockets. The next thing I did was lay my case down flat. I want the socket pointing up because I did not glue my IHS, remember? So it's gonna slide around, especially if we're installing this uh, vertically. I don't want that. I don't wanna have to hold the IHS in place all the time. Uh, so lay it down flat. And then if you press on the IHS enough, it will not move when you install the socket, when you remount it. Uh, and remember, that's gonna put a lot of pressure on the IHS so it won't move after that. We can now lay our case back upright. Now, upon first boot again, you shouldn't have to you know, clear your CMOS. There's really nothing that's gonna change here because all you did was remove your CPU and effectively reinstall it. Uh, so everything should be able to remain the same. Uh, you won't have to go in and recalibrate fan curves and all that good stuff. Uh, you will though wanna check temperatures right away because if you notice a really you know, sharp dip in idles and load temperatures, then you're gonna wanna probably take advantage of the extra overclocking headroom. If not, you're gonna have a super quiet system. Maybe that's what you were going for. Either way, it's a win-win. All right, and initial results right after the D-lid, exact same specs, exact same BIOS settings, 1.35 V-Core at five gigahertz. Check out these temps in Ida64. So this is the uh, CPU stress test, and you can see we have about a 20 to 25 degree delta uh, by doubling down on our liquid metal application. So we have liquid metal between the die and the IHS and between the IHS and the CryoRig CPU cooler. You can see we're coming up in on the 10 minute mark and we have absolutely no CPU throttling. There's no reason for it to exist because our temperatures are well below T-junction. Uh, right now we're hovering just under 90 degrees Celsius uh, and with an air cooler, it's gonna basically be leveled off by this point uh, temperature wise. So uh, this is the peak. You can see temperatures are relatively stable. They do dip down quite a bit. It's not as consistent as I would have hoped. So occasionally you can see these cores are dropping to about 70 degrees Celsius. That core hit, that's the highest temperature I've seen yet, 93 degrees Celsius. Um, this just might not be a, a very well bin chip. You see some people getting 5.2, 5.3 gigahertz with their 8700Ks. Uh, this is a, a uh, marketing sample. It's a sample that they send to motherboard manufacturers. So they're not gonna be the best. They're more or less used for biostability testing. Um, and that's probably why the results here aren't that great. But I wasn't looking for an extreme overclock by any means. I just wanted a cooler system, a quieter system overall. And that's exactly what we have with these temps here. Uh, and this isn't, you know, the beefiest cooler around. This is a pretty modest cooler, 150 or so watt TDP. Uh, so it's doing a great job, given the circumstances, staying relatively quiet under full load. So I'm gonna summarize these graphs just a bit. Uh, definitely a sharp drop in especially idle temperatures. The idles at five gigahertz at 1.35 volts before were about 45 degrees Celsius or so. Those dropped to about 35, between 35 and 40 really. Uh, every core kind of goes up and down and that can vary depending on whether or not you're manually setting your V-Core or if you have an offset or if you're letting it run auto, which I don't recommend because a lot of these motherboards will pump too much voltage through the uh, CPU, especially when you don't need it. They're gonna run harder than normal. Your system's gonna run louder than normal. Just manually set it and you'll be better off, trust me. Now in regards to loads, we also saw a significant drop in overall temperatures from 95 and 100 degrees Celsius initially without the D-lid to about 75, it was between 75 and 85 degrees Celsius usually. Uh, it did spike just a, a little bit occasionally. Sometimes we'd hit 90 degrees Celsius. Uh, and I think that just has to do with the fact that all I was really doing was tweaking the voltage. That's it. I wasn't playing with base clock or anything else in the BIOS. Uh, so maybe I can fine tune it. I'm actually right now running at 1.32 volts. So I was able to squeak it down just a little bit. The D-Lid won't really fix that. The, the CPU is, itself is actually gonna determine the you know, voltage tolerance, not really the D-Lid. The D-Lid just fixes the temperature aspect uh, of the issue. So I, I could actually you know, drop voltage just a bit more. I could have done that beforehand as well. Um, but overall, about 80 to 85 degrees Celsius under full load, and that's at five gigahertz across all six cores, which is impressive for any CPU, let alone one that 
originally runs pretty hot. So in closing, if you consider yourself an enthusiast, I strongly recommend this kit. If you're rocking an i7 or an i5 from the last two or so generations, KB Lake, Coffee Lake especially, they're gonna benefit the most from the D-Lid. And honestly, I mean, how many CPUs do you hear about being RMA? Usually it's the motherboard or the power supply, uh, even the graphics card or storage drive, right? How, how many CPUs legitimately die just from running hard, even when you're gaming or content creating. Uh, so unless you royally screw something up during the delude process, it's worth the voiding the warranty. It really is. It sucks that we have to do it. Intel should never use that terrible thermal interface material that they've been using ever again. Hopefully the next generation is soldered on like Ryzen's, uh, but it's Intel, you know. I'm not gonna hold them to really do anything. Nothing's gonna surprise me from them at this point. Uh, so yeah, it sucks we have to do it, but ultimately it's what we have to do if we want great overclocks uh, Ender Bowers kit is the one I do recommend. I've actually used two different D-Lid kits and this is the one I prefer uh, because it's so simple to use straight up, you know, a few different tools here you combine and the D-Lid process, like, a, like I said, takes about five minutes. It's very quick, um, you know, to, to apply the liquid metal, which is a very inconsistent liquid. It's definitely different than water, the way it behaves. And then reapplying your CPU cooler, all that jazz will take about 30 minutes in total, but it's worth it. It's worth the price of the kit and it's worth the warranty void in my opinion opinion. Again, though, those are pros and cons you need to weigh. Leave a comment in the comment section below and give it a thumbs up if you thought it was cool. Dislike the video if you disliked it or if you hate everything about life. You can click that red subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for more content like this. This is Science Studio. Thanks for dealing with us.